Well, I want to say good morning to each of you here at the factory as well. If you're tuning in from uh, wherever you are, welcome. Thank you for carving out the time to be with us. Uh, wherever you find yourselves, whether that's, you know, maybe on the other side of the ocean or whether that's at your cabin or at home, uh, it's great to be with you as well. Now, before uh, we dig in together today, I want to take a couple of minutes just to celebrate um, uh, some moments this last week that I think were very significant for us together as a church. Um, first of all, uh, if we rewind all the way back to 2016, not sure how many of you would have been around at that point, um, but uh, we had the privilege of, of walking through a, a process together as a church where we sponsored two refugee families to come here to Canada and to be here in Winnipeg. Um, and one of those families was a Syrian family that had fled um, the war uh, as refugees to a neighboring country. Um, and we had the opportunity to sponsor this family, now a family of six, um, some parents and four children that, uh, that came and found a place of safety here. And it's been amazing to watch their journey over the last seven years. Um, they now are, uh, they've started a company um, and are employed and they've bought a house and they're just thriving as a family here, uh, which has been really amazing to see. But uh, shortly after they arrived, um, they you know, let us know that they would love to um, one day see some of their other family members, some immediate family members, also find a place of safety here because um, they had been scattered by the impacts of the war there. And so a, a number of years back, we started the process. Um, well, there was a couple that was really involved with this family from our church who were, were journeying with them. And together, this family and that couple started a process. And as a church, we've come alongside to support that uh, to um, sponsor uh, some of their immediate family members to come because they were still in refugee camps after fleeing the war. Sadly, um, last year, uh, the, the brother of, of, of this family um, was actually killed in the conflict, um, and so that was something that we grieved with them. But there's uh, some other processes that were in place, and so um, we, this last week, um, were able to welcome uh, his, the brother and sis, uh, sister-in-law and their two young children to come here and to find their place of safety um, here, as well as the mother um, who's been suffering with some illness, um, but they were able to get them to land here. And so I just want to take a moment to celebrate the significance of this, um, the incredible work um, that some folks have been doing to, to do this. It has been a long process because COVID actually kind of stopped most of the progress of that for a, a couple of years. But this is a very significant week as they've been reunited and found a place of safety here. So um, that's, uh, that's been really neat to see. As well, I um, want to take a moment to celebrate that this last week on Tuesday, July 11th, um, we celebrated our official one year since opening the doors of Riverwood House, which is awesome, yeah. And I'm, uh, I just want to say what an incredible adventure it's been. It's been a, a year of a lot of learning, but we've got this incredible team, staff team, that has risen to that challenge, and they're doing remarkable work. Uh, if you haven't heard about this, Riverwood House is a 40-unit supportive recovery housing complex just uh, across the street from here, um, where uh, we are trying to meet the gap uh, in the need of our city, where if somebody is, is struggling with, uh, in homelessness or in uh, how, being housing insecure and also battling addictions, when they take that step um, to get treatment and exit uh, successfully from that, but not have no safe place to go, um, the chances of succeeding are so small. And so Riverwood House is meant to be a second stage housing that catches that gap and allows people to carry on in their recovery journey. It's been amazing to be a part of these folks' lives as they come in. We've had 41 different people through Riverwood House um, throughout this last year. Um, we've had some really challenging um, and heartbreaking situations that have come out of that because um, this is a world that's very complex and difficult as people um, try to pursue their recovery. But we've also seen some incredibly successful and, and remarkable impacts. Um, some folks that have left Riverwood House to be reunited with their kids or because they've gotten employment and they're moving out into independent living um, through that support that's been able to be there and the folks that are living there right now. So just want to take a moment. On Friday, they had they gathered as a community and had a birthday cake to celebrate one year. Um, and so we celebrate with them as a church. And thank you for each of you that have been a part of that process and a part of supporting that. Um, really, really remarkable. All right. Today I want to begin by asking you if you have participated in this latest craze called 
pickleball. Anybody out there? Have you become part of the craze? Okay, we got a few for sure. Yeah, yeah. Pickleball has entered the scene with uh, a lot of enthusiasm. I've, I see there's courts, uh, tennis courts getting trans, transferred over to pickleball courts all over the place. Everybody's talking about it, and it's just kind of a, a wave sweeping over. Now, I'll tell you that my introduction to pickleball was a few years back, and it, it came with a lot of cynicism for myself, I'm ashamed to say. But I was invited um, to play, to try this out, because I was out at the, uh, at the beach with my in-laws, and uh, at their community center out at the beach, they said, hey, there's this game called pickleball. Everybody loves playing it. Why don't you come? And so I joined and, and tried to play there. And uh, to put it gently, I mean, I was playing with, you know, those that were a little further along in their journey than I was. And so uh, when, I, when I started, I'm like, hey, this is kind of fun. People are active. It's awesome. But uh, I can't really compete at this because it's sort of an older person's game. And so... What I will say is this, I, I, I left that saying, hey, that's great, but, you know, I'll stick to some other sports. And I, st I was known to say to my friends a few times, I'm a terrible person, but I said this, I said, hey, listen, if I ever start playing pickleball, then you know I've given up on life. <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad. Now, fast forward to this past spring break. We had a few families that we got together with and did a road trip over spring break. And so we drove to Utah um, and rented a big Airbnb together uh, with three families. And at that complex were pickleball courts. And they had the rackets there. So we said, hey, why not? Let's try this out. And I'll tell you, we got onto those courts with our kids and we couldn't stop playing. We were having a blast. And we played for hours. And I'll tell you, I had a full 180. I had to eat a lot of words. I had to phone a few people and apologize for my words, uh, but, but, but really got into it. And actually now it's funny to watch because my boys, they're just, they're, their friends are picking them up and they're heading out to play pickleball for three or four hours at a time. Um, and it's just, just wild. So I want to begin today by saying a phrase and asking you this question or comparing two different aspects of a phrase. I could say this, I wish I was a better pickleball player. And I could say this, this statement with two different scenarios. One scenario, which is my scenario presently, I could say I wish I was a better pickleball player, but I'll tell you this, every week I'm getting an invite from my office mates to come play. They play every Tuesday night or every Wednesday night. It's a routine. They always invite me, and I'm, I've never shown up to one of their invitations to date because my schedule always fills up. And so I say, you know, it'd be fun. I'd like to do that. Beyond one kind of fun afternoon in Utah, you know, I've, I've, my enthusiasm about that sport has been met without any engagements at all. I mean, I did click buy on Amazon to get a couple of rackets and get the balls, but that's really what my boys have been playing with. But I, I finally got a chance this last week to get back out and play, and I lost more points than I made because I just kept getting confused with the rules, just because I haven't been in the game. I haven't been trying this out. Now, I could say... Or my kids could say the same statement. I wish I was a better pickleball player. And then I watch the actions that come with that. My boys are out there almost every day playing for three or four hours at a time. My office mates, I mean, they me never miss their scheduled evening. Why? It's not because their schedule doesn't conflict. It's because they schedule that in and everything else is scheduled around it. It's their priority. And they add extra evenings to it. In fact, I found out this last week you have to pay attention to using the right pickleball if you're playing outside versus playing inside. I mean, this, there's a lot of passion and, and into that. So I would say this. I could say the same statement to you, but one is a passive statement. I wish I was with nothing attached to it. That's my scenario. But another one I would call an active statement. One's more a statement of sentiment. Ah, maybe one day. That would be fun if it happens. The other carries a sense of commitment, of pursuit. And that's what I'd like to explore with you today. Of course, not about pickleball. Today we continue as we gather to, to journey through our summer with this theme that says everywhere you go. Not sure where your adventures have taken you thus far this summer, but we're well aware that with our short and cherished Manitoba summers, we often see a bit of a scattering together as a church, whether you go into the lake, 
to the beach, on a road trip, camping, canoeing. I mean, it's a ton of fun to take our summers in well. But our encouragement to each of you and to each of you that are joining in today is to, to carve out those, those few minutes where we can be together, where we can gather around this idea and connect as we explore the role of prayer in our faith and in our lives all summer long. There are 222 actual prayers that we discover in the Bible. Each has their own stories to reveal about prayer overlaying into our faith. And we've learned over these last five weeks of some of those. Today I want to focus in on a very short prayer. A prayer that's found amongst the very last strokes of the pen of our scriptures in Revelation 22, verse 20, and it says simply this, Amen, come Lord Jesus. With these four short words, I'd like to consider this, much like my opening statement about pickleball. When you hear this short prayer, it can either be said as a passive statement or as an active statement statement. But when we take the time to actually look and dig into Scripture a little, we'll discover what I think ought to be one of the most active prayers we can actually pray. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, as we arrive at these very few words at the end of the book of Revelation, I think most of us would read these words and just assign them immediately to this realm or this discussion about the end times. I mean, Revelation, a book I think is often misunderstood and put back on the shelf because of so many wild and differing interpretations about raptures and Armageddons and apocalypses and antichrist and all these crazy symbols that we discover. Some of it probably just feels a bit overwhelming to take in. Or maybe for others, it becomes a fascination to say, well, wonder what's the theories about all of these things. But beyond that, None of it really seems to translate into the context of our everyday routines. And as such, I think it really has become almost this passive prayer that says, ah, I'm pretty sure the Bible says that one day something is going to happen at the end of the world. And Jesus comes back, and so I guess we'll just kind of wait till then. Probably not in my lifetime, but maybe, but one day... This will happen, and it becomes this passive approach. The actual title of the book of Revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis, which, of course, for us, instantly brings up images that involve destruction or damage or an, a, cat, a catastrophic scale. We think in terms of a nuclear apocalypse in our world or a zombie apocalypse that comes to our world. We see these images with extraordinary movie titles um, that come along with it. However, in its origins, this Greek word apocalypse has simply meant to uncover. To uncover. Revelation was a book that was all about uncovering the hope that Jesus brought in the midst of their struggles, their current struggles. Not so much about the one day in the future, but that the very present and very real struggles that his readers were facing, John wrote this vision even as he himself was enduring great suffering. He was a prisoner on an island under the oppressive rule of Roman Empire and had experienced the persecution and torture himself. And it was written to uncover or to reveal and encourage his readers with hope that one, that Jesus would come to make things right. And ultimately, in the midst of their struggles, in the middle of, of what they were experiencing, that the world around them would be made right again, and that God's kingdom would rule again. Revelation was not a book of destruction, but a book of hope in the midst of the world around them. And, that, and in it, we discover in the most remarkable way that it actually brings the entire story of Scripture to a crescendo. And it fills us with hope, not just for a one-day event that we wait for, but for the invitation each of us have to discover this prayer actively every day. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. 
Four simple words that compel us not to simply stop in a, in a prayer of sentiment about a future event, but to see ourselves as active players, invited to participate in the unfolding drama of the world around us as Jesus followers. So as we explore this short prayer for a few minutes together today, let's first understand that this phrase actually has a history for Jesus followers that before they were penned here in Revelation. And that history is found in a term that some of you might find familiar, especially if you've lived through the 80s or 90s in the church, and it's the Aramaic phrase, Maranatha, Maranatha. The early church and the New Testament emerged in a Greek-speaking context, and so we discover that there's this Aramaic phrase that's referenced by the early church uh, uh, that, we, that we find. It's actually transliterated into the writing as an Aramaic word, much like we might use the word resume, and we call it an English word, but it's actually a French word. We've, we've adopted that. The same was true for this word Maranatha. It was referred to in the writings, and it indicates it was a common phrase that was used uh, frequently at the time. Two Aramaic words uh, that, that become a single common expression, and it literally simply meant, come, Lord, come, Lord. What we discover in this phrase in the early church is that it was both, it was a common prayer that they shared as well as a very common greeting amongst followers of Jesus. Maranatha, a shared prayer about the anticipated return of Jesus, but also this phrase that was used as a greeting. And when we consider the context in which it was, it becomes even more clear. The early church was in the midst of very difficult and persecution and struggle. The greeting was much more than a simple greeting of hello, but it became a greeting that in, in a simple moment, in a phrase, they could identify with each other in a moment the shared struggle that they were facing, the hardships, and all of the shared hope that they had wrapped into a simple phrase. In fact, it's thought that at, at, at times it was even used as a code word for believers to identify one another when the, the, there was significant persecution and the church was hidden underground. Maranatha was a term of hope. A sincere and commonplace cry coming from a desire for Jesus to come and return in the middle of their struggles. So as we arrive at this prayer in the final words of the book of Revelation, amen, come Lord Jesus, we first understand that this phrase already had a context in the church, a meaning that was anchored to the hope that one day their struggle would end and that one day what the one that they were following would return to bring justice and peace to their place. So feel free to turn to the person next to you and say, Maranatha. There you go. All right, awkward moment over, especially for you at Starbucks out there. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Next, let's consider the beginning of this prayer that we find. The Amen. Amen, we know, is the correct way to end a prayer, right? If you're in a group context and you're praying with other people and somebody doesn't say amen, everybody just sort of starts to peek through one eye to see if it's over. Is it, are we done here or is this actually done? Amen, in this context, though, is actually the first word of the prayer, which presents us with a question. Because amen is simply a statement of agreement. In fact, it's funny to me when we pray and we end our prayers with amen because we're essentially just saying, I agree with what I just said. But as we discover this prayer at the end of Revelation, the amen begs this question, what was it that was being agreed to? As we arrive at these last two verses, we discover they are basically a summation of the entire book of Revelation to the reader. Now, we don't have time to dig deep into understanding this entire book that's wrapped up in this amen, but I want to highlight a couple of important themes that I think illuminate the meaning of this short prayer. I'm convinced of this. Revelation was written to a specific group of people who were experiencing horrific injustices, brutal persecution under the oppression of the emperor of Rome, and it was a letter delivering the desperate message of hope that God's story was ultimately about the return, about the return of, of, 
of Jesus into the, the, the justice and restoration of the world around him. In the midst of all of the pain and the brokenness and the oppression that they had around them. That there would be a time coming when things would be made right. And so the amen, what's being agreed with, was this remarkable and illustrative and very symbolic grand vision that John wrote about the hopeful return of Jesus to establish his kingdom again in the world around them. And so for us to understand this prayer, we must also place ourselves back into the perspective that those readers would have understood this. It was never a grand vision for them that they read about being whisked away from all of their troubles, but rather a vision that Jesus would return to restore the world that they were in. I think we often confuse which direction this book actually speaks about. In the first couple of centuries following the birth of the church, there was an offshoot of this group of Jesus followers called Christians that was called Gnosticism. Now, I share this because I think there's been an, a, a significant impact from the remnants of this movement that have surfaced throughout the church and throughout its history. And I actually think there's a significant influence that, 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 that bears in our Western world take on our understanding of Christianity itself. I think it also distances us from truly understanding the worldview and the context of much of the writings of the New Testament. So without getting too deep philosophically, because I, I, I could have a lot of long conversations about how I think the modern faith has a Gnostic influence, let me explain briefly what the Gnostic movement was. Influenced by philosophers like Plato, Gnosticism was based uh, basically kind of on two premises. First, it was built on a perspective of dualism regarding spirit and matter, or the physical world and the spiritual world. Gnostics assert that matter, the physical world, is inherently evil and it's in decay and it's distinct and separate from the spiritual world. And that the goal is ultimately achieved when we have a spiritual departure of the physical world where ultimate good is found. And second, Gnostics claim to possess an elevated knowledge or a higher truth only discovered by a certain few. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which literally just means to know. Gnostics claim to possess a higher knowledge and that this knowledge is revealed in a spiritual realm and becomes their achievement of freedom. And this was a slow migration that happened from the Christian tradition that was in the early church. And I do think it a very fascinating exercise to discover how much this influence has developed and how much we in turn read our scriptures through the, the influence of Gnosticism. But back to our simple four-word prayer today and how does this overlay? Well, I think in the context of the culmination of this book of Revelation, we often apply, uh, apply a one-day-in-the-future apocalyptic event in which Jesus returns to whisk his, way, his, his people back into a spiritual realm and finalize the destruction of our world. I think when we relegate this prayer, amen, come Lord Jesus, to simply a prayer that awaits a one day in the future rescue event. It's where we find the language of commonly sung hymns like, some glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away. To a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. I mean, it's a great tune. But I don't think this is the message that we actually discover in the book of Revelation at all. I think, in fact, it's become obvious that we get the direction of this all mixed up. Revelation was not a, an event about leaving earth to heaven. Revelation was actually all about the movement of heaven to earth. Throughout Scripture, heaven wasn't referred to 
as a place where the clouds are and the harps are and all of those things, imageries that we have, heaven was understood as simply the place that encompassed God's reign and rule. It was not a Gnostic understanding. It didn't, didn't begin with matter and gradually get refined into spirit. God's story doesn't begin with the material universe and work itself away from it, graduating it into an immaterial universe. His vision at the end of Revelation brings to display this very prayer that Jesus gave us when he said, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven where you are where your reign is. To the early readers, heaven was not a remote place, either in time or in space, but it was an immediate place. For John, heaven was not what we wait for after death, but what is barely out of the reach of our senses, but brought alive in the visions of Revelation. Heaven is the current reality that encompasses the reign of God. And it gives us the ability to grasp onto hope in the middle of, of it, in the middle of what we see around us, and to understand that we together are in the birthing pains of a new creation that is actively calling us to be involved, to participate in God's remaking of creation, of his renewing of creation. The vision of Revelation is the descent of heaven, the descent of God's reign on to creation, the way it was made to be, the way it was originally created for. Eugene Peterson says it this way, we interpret heaven in terms of earth instead of interpreting earth in terms of heaven. We see this really plainly in Revelation 21, verse 2 to 4. We read the description that's given to us of a large city called the New Jerusalem that literally descends onto the earth. It says this, I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. It goes on to describe this picture of a beautiful, geometrically perfect cube. It explicitly brings, actually, to to memory the structure that was called the Holy of Holies, designed for Solomon's temple that we read of in the Old Testament, which is where God's presence resided for them. The original design was 2,700 cubic feet But the image given here that is painted in Revelation was 3.2 million cubic miles large, meant to sort of overwhelm your senses, meant to give the reader a sense of its completeness, of its wholeness, of the all-encompassing impact of God's presence in the renewed earth as heaven collides with it. The closing scene of the Bible wasn't one where humans went up to heaven, nor of even simply Jesus coming down. The closing scene was about the new Jerusalem itself coming down from heaven to earth and where God and his reign and his kingdom fully inhabit the earth once again. This is the amen of this prayer in which it is said, come, Lord Jesus. And just to take it one more step further, and I know I have talked about this before, but I think it's such a profound and important um, thing for us to understand in the story of Scripture, that we find in the very opening chapters of the Bible a mirror image to the very closing chapters in this remarkable story. In Genesis 1, we read this, in the beginning God created, what, the heavens and the earth. And we skip forward to, to what it says in verse 8 and 9 later, and it says that there was a garden planted in Eden. The Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. In the middle was the, of the garden was the tree of life. And a river of life flowing from it, from the garden, from Eden. And so we get this picture of, of what creation was made to be with this imagery. We're given this picture of completeness of wholeness. 
We're given this picture of where God's dwelling place was literally among his people, where heaven and earth were in community. And then we discover in this story the curse, where pain and suffering and death enter into our world. It's framed in the context of our decision to take power into our own hands, to be our own God for ourselves. And in that, we see the impact of sin and brokenness and pain enter our world. We no longer live in the wholeness that God created us for. The curse is the consequence of sin. The shame and the hurt and the fear and the anger and hostility is what I think creates the chaos in what we see in the world all around us. And more significant than all of this is we no longer live with God dwelling among us. Our community with God is broken. This is the imagery that Genesis paints for us. But then we fast forward to the very final pages of this story. And we discover something about this, this prayer, or this is where we discover the prayer we, we talk about today, Revelation 21 and 22. But check out what it says. It says, then I saw a renewed heaven and earth. And it talks about the angel showed me the river of the, uh, of the water of life. And so in the middle uh, of, this, of this, this renewed creation was the, the, the river of life. And then it talks about on each side of the river stood the tree of life. On, and it, talks, uh, uh, it continues on to say this, this river uh, stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. No longer, it says, will there be any curse. And so you get this, this picture painted for you that at the very opening chapter and then the very last chapter, there's a mirror image that tells the story of our faith, of Scripture. I think there exists this pervasive idea that the world is wasting away and that we'll, we will be able to escape it to an alternate place when it comes to its demise, and that somehow our faith is framed in terms of an escape from a failed creation, an experiment that's gone wrong. But I just don't see this through my interpretation of Scripture. I think it's probably much more a product of pop Christianity ripe with what I see as the influence of the Gnostic dualism that we frame our faith in. And frankly, I think it moves us towards praying this prayer that we discover today, come, Lord Jesus, much like my approach to pickleball, very passively. But Revelation paints a picture of a king that reigns with justice, where pain and tears and fear are not part of the picture. On the backdrop of much suffering and struggle and pain, we see this hopeful picture of a restored creation as it was created to be whole again. And we catch, when we catch a vision of what God is calling us towards, we will begin to live as though heaven is being brought down to earth. It will become our sincere and earnest prayer. God, your kingdom come here on earth. Come, Lord Jesus, was not about a one day, but it will be about today. Our faith isn't so much framed as a ticket out of this world, but we're meant to become residents. In fact, we're literally called citizens of heaven, citizens of his kingdom preparing and awaiting for the great move in where God re-inhabits the earth, where everything is made right again, where justice reigns, and where God recreates and renews and restores this earth as the fulfillment of the opening chapter of this incredible story. And here's the remarkable thing, is that we are all invited. And what's so compelling to me through the story of Scripture is that we are invited to enact these events every day that we have breath. We become part of the actual tangible experience of renewal here on earth, of God's kingdom here on earth. I think it's very interesting 
when we look back to, the, to Jesus as he was with his disciples, and they asked him specifically about the end of the age that he spoke of and about the, the day that he would return in Matthew 24. And Jesus simply gives them a picture of the master who has left his servants in charge of his estate. That's the image he gives them. In, in Matthew 24, we read this, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. And in the context of this conversation, he immediately goes on to what's described, what this would look like to be doing what your master has asked you in Matthew 25. We discover in these parables that, that bring into focus the very ordinary and everyday work of the servants, that the good servants, and uh, of, of them doing very ordinary things. And what do we read in Matthew 25 as Jesus explains this? He says, they fed the hungry. They clothed the naked. They welcomed strangers. They visited prisoners, and they gave water to the thirsty. In fact, when we read that in Matthew 25, it's, it's, it's curious to see that, that these activities were so ordinary that these righteous sheep they spoke of actually had no realization they'd done anything important. Church, the work we are invited into doesn't have to be extravagant. In fact, the most powerful ways of working towards this picture of justice and wholeness that God is, is working towards is being found to be present in the very real and ordinary struggles of the world around us. This is why I believe that working towards a biblical view of justice in our world that, that not staying on the sidelines in the midst of the brokenness and the pain and the struggle of the world around us is not just a nice idea for some Christians to do. But that as members, as citizens of the kingdom of God, as citizens of heaven as we are called, it's literally our vocation to join in with God and his vision of a world that is restored to the wholeness that it was created for. Come, Lord Jesus, to me feels like a passive, empty prayer if we simply see this as a one-day event in the future. But I believe as we place it into the context that it was written, what emerges is a powerful prayer that when spoken with earnesty actually compels us to take action. This is what compels us as a church to be connected to the needs around us, why we are here to celebrate a year of Riverwood House being open, why we open our doors every single week to the needs of our neighbors around us here in Elmwood, why we participated and will continue to work towards these refugee sponsorships, and why each of us, I believe, is invited to participate in the routine and ordinary opportunities that are placed in front of you every day. Do you have the courage to pray this prayer, come Lord Jesus, with a vision of a two-day encounter? to go about your day or your week or in your workplace and to actually pray this prayer with your eyes open of what it might mean for God's kingdom to be made known right among the current needs that you see. And so I invite you to pray this prayer with the perspective that I believe it was heard in Revelation to the first readers. Come, Lord Jesus. Don't relegate it to a one day in the future, but pray it as a prayer that's an inv invitation for God to meet us in this moment today. Thanks for your time and for listening. And we uh, encourage you, wherever you head out this week, wherever you find yourselves, um, to continue to dig in and, and make prayer a practice into your routine this summer. We're going to take a few moments to close in worship. I invite you, if you're able to, to stand with us.
and uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun revisiting 1994 together, all right? <laughs>